um, cover at the release of um, William Shaw's latest book, Gravesend. Hi, William. Hiya. Very good to be here. Nice to see you again, Alex. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, could you tell us a little bit about Gravesend and how that came about? Yeah, I'd, um, I'd written a book that was kind of before this series started called The Bird Watcher, which was set in Dungeness. And when I wrote The Bird Watcher, I spent a long time thinking about what the book was going to be about. Was, I knew it was going to be in Dungeness. And I started thinking, who goes to Dungeness? And I got involved with writing about bird watchers because they're a major part of, of that landscape. And it was really fascinating because I'm not a bird watcher. I've got a huge amount of respect for people who know all that stuff and do that. But I had to learn a lot about bird watching while I was doing that. And I, I really enjoyed the experience. And I, with this book, I kind of wanted to do something similar. I wanted to find the excuse to write a book in which I learned something about natural history and could speak to some of those experts. Because obviously every book, at some point, if you're writing a police procedural, you talk to police officers and you get them to say some stuff, and you learn a bit of stuff like that. But I like to learn stuff outside the procedure as well. And I thought I'd do something about natural history. And I was talking to, I talked to various ecologists and there's ecology's turned into this huge profession because every time you are going to build a road, build HS2 or build a housing estate or something, you have to speak to ecologists. And so I spoke to a couple of these people and they both completely independently said badgers, do badgers. Badgers are a really interesting topic. And actually, they were talking about um, badgers as from, you know, because they're politically fascinating because of because of um, uh, bovine TB and all that sort of stuff. But actually, I found them fascinating as creatures because they were just, you know, that we don't know about badgers. We know so little. We've lived alongside badgers all the time we've been on this island, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But we we know so little about them. And that's a great I found that a great metaphor. Do you know what I mean? If a detective's there to uncover stuff and yet somehow there's this bits of natural history we don't know anything about, which sounds really weird. But I really enjoyed it. Does that make any sense? It, it does. Um, um, I really I really enjoyed learning about birds as well from the bird watcher. Um, there was something you said about uh, a bird in a car park, I think, something. Yes. Yeah, because I had to I, <laughs> I I had to get lots of people to help me with the bird watcher and I gave them the manuscript. And at one point there was a um a desert warbler spotted in this car in the my in my plot, my de my detective spots a desert warbler in this car park just outside Sandgate in the Kent coast. And um I handed this to these various bird watchers. I had asked to read the manuscript and said, "Can you spot me all the mistakes?" And the last thing I expected them to say was was that they shouldn't that this scene was wrong. Um, and when they did, I said, "No, it's not wrong because I know somebody's seen in that exact spot. Somebody's seen a desert warbler." And I said, "Well, the point is, you've written a detective seeing a desert warbler in this car park, and he's a bird watcher. He's a birder. He's a real keen birder, and he knows his stuff. If he'd seen a desert warbler in that car park." doesn't matter if he's interested in a murder inquiry. He's going to stay in that car park because that's a top bird. And I love finding stuff like that because, you know, actually they were right. You know, and if so, if you, for 99% of readers, that wouldn't have made any difference. But the ones who really knew their birds, that would have been wrong because they would have spotted that, you know, he's just walked out, walk, seen, spotted a, a desert warbler and then wandered away. And a real birder wouldn't do that. So they began to dial it down and finding slightly less rare birds. And I love that kind of stuff because i was kind of learning as i went so um those details are really important to get right i think yeah i love i love the use of zoe as the uh information person in the in the um, graves end um how is it used to write a teenager ah well how is it to write a teenager i there's two answers to that one one is i'm i'm a parent and i've had two teenagers so from that level I kind of know how teenagers, how random they can be and how passionate they can be. And the other thing is, because they're sort of random and passionate, I think you can, you know, whenever I meet teenagers, A, the society depicts teenagers as all the same, as sort of sulky in, in hoodies and, and all that. And actually, whenever you know teenagers, they're not like that. You know, very, they might be like that for five minutes, but 
10 minutes later, they're somebody completely different. They're much less conventional than we are when we're older. So you've got, the B point is that you've got complete freedom. So you can make teenagers be all sorts of things, which I did in the last book. In the last book, um, Deadland, I had a couple of teenagers who were ne'er do wells. And I just quite like the fact they do stuff unexpectedly. So I think you can be much more creative sometimes than with adults in a weird way. Um, you, you know, it gives you a lot of freedom. Um, and But also, I kind of also know how how strange and, and moody they can be from personal experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just thought that um, with seeing what Eddie Griffiths has done with the Go Called Justice, I thought there might be a possibility for you to do that with Zoe, I thought. Not really good. Oh, that's good. Idea, I quite like that idea. Yeah, that um, yeah, you could actually write something actually directly from her point of view, but I'm not confident enough to do that, actually. I mean, I quite like that. Um, I'd just like to say hello to everybody who's commenting. I can't tell you, what, from my end of it, I can't see the names, but but um, thanks for whoever it was said love, they love the bird watcher. Yeah, it really is a great book. For, any, for anyone that uh, has, uh, hasn't read your other series, could you tell us about the links between the two series? Yeah, this was um, when I wrote the Birdwatcher. I'd written I'd written three, four, three books actually set in the nineteen sixties. That's how I started being a crime writer. I was really fascinated by. It's quite a long story actually. What happened is I joined a writers group in Brighton where I live in two thousand, and the other person in my writers group, uh, who was a, who was really committed to writing, was a writer called C J Sampson, who's quite successful, and he was quite successful early on. He he. He was writing Dissolution when we were in the writers group. And he, he, I can remember him reading the first chapter as a draft on that. And we were all going, oh, OK. You know, this is, this is, you know, he knows what he's doing. And it, it was fully formed. He'd kind of written that book. And we need, you know, um, and it was kind of watching him then turn into this massive hit writer that he was, was amazing. So I was writing some stuff and I suddenly realised I was writing stuff set in 1968 and it was a detective sort of thing. And I thought, I can't do historical fiction because Chris is doing that. Uh, so what can I do? So I made it, I, I did the series about almost like, because I was a, a music journalist for many years, I made the series about popular culture and about the Beatles and all that stuff that was coming up and about how I think during that time, people had very definite views about what was good good culture and bad culture. You know, if you liked the Beatles, you kind of understood them. But people like my dad didn't really understand them. And I thought that was a great, if you had a, so a detective who was like my dad, who didn't really get the 1960s, and you put him with a younger person, um, you would get uh, some drama out of it. So I wrote a series with basically an older cop and a younger cop in the 1960s. And I loved doing it. It was great. Um, and that as these two cops fell in love and they had a, had a child at the end of my last book, there was, you know, there was, they were pregnant. But when I started writing The Birdwatch, I, this woman detective was needed. And I suddenly thought, I wonder who she is. And I suddenly figured out that in my head, I knew who she was if she was the child of those two detectives I wrote about in the 1960s. Yeah. And so I knew that. So I didn't say it in The Birdwatch. It wasn't obvious at all. That I, but I just put that in. And it was really interesting because everybody, when the Birdwatcher came out, this detective has to do something quite bad. Uh, and I got a lot of adverse reaction from, from readers about saying, oh, wasn't she harsh? And, oh, I didn't like her very much. I loved the book, didn't like her very much. And I thought that was really interesting. So I'd never really intended to take her as a character, but the more people sort of like said, oh, I'm not sure I like this woman, Alex Cooperty. I thought I'm gonna take that and see if I can turn it around and make her a series. And so she is the daughter of the people in the first series. And then she became almost accidentally the sort of person I then wanted to write about in Dungeness. And so she started this new series. Very long answer. Yes, but interesting. Um, what was so fascinating about the third watcher, though, was also you, you wrote about the troubles in there. Um, yeah. And of course, that's about writing about things that are uncomfortable, which is relevant to today, isn't it, with the corona and things. Um, what do you think people will do about writing about things people wouldn't want to talk about? I think that is part of what we do, isn't it? I think one of the nice things about crime fiction, and one of the reasons why it is so massively successful, and I've been very lucky to fall into something 
that is so successful is because it entertains us. It you know it really is gripping and it it does all that plot things, but it's also doing something else a lot of the time. Quite often it's looking at at bigger stuff. A lot of the psychological fiction is really looking at the sort of Me Too issues uh, within domestic sphere or within the internet and stuff like that. And I think a lot of detective fiction looks at society and all those uncomfortable bits of society. And in the weird way, detectives in detective fiction are kind of not just investigating the crime, they're inve investigating contemporary society. So it will be investigating that. But I don't know how, and I think that's a really curious question about how it looks at what happens now. And I, the reason I don't think I can say what it is is because I don't think we know what, where this lands yet. And so I think there will be three or four really brilliant books, like Peter May's got a book out now, which is kind of retooled to fit it, which he'd written in, which will be about one aspect of the pandemic is that normal life becomes hard. And so his book is set against you know, his book Lockdown is about how policing becomes hard under lockdown. And I can understand that sort of thing, but it doesn't necessarily look at um, pandemic and what that does. And I think it's going to take us a little longer to figure that out because I think we do this quite earnestly and quite seriously. And I didn't, in the same way you mentioned the troubles, d crime fiction wasn't written about the troubles till 10 years after the troubles finished. And I think we need time to actually digest that and get it right. Complex stuff like now. That's my guess. But, you know, who knows? There might be a brilliant crime writer writing something fantastic about the pandemic now. I don't know. I'm sure there is. Not me. Now, now you've written about a historical and modern. Which is your favourite to write about? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm so, like, they're both they're all my children. I can't have favourites. I don't know. I really would like to get back to writing about the 1960s. That was a lot of fun. And the research on that is always great. Um, and I, I keep saying these lovely comments in the, um, in the thing, and I don't know who's saying them because you can't see the things, but thank you very much. And yes, want William South and Cupid to get romantic. Oh, um, I prefer at the moment, I do prefer writing the Cupid series because when I did that, part of the reason I wrote, the Kubernetes series was to write about um, to write about ecology and natural history, because I think you know um, that part of our lives isn't going that well. You know, I think you know we do we're, we're not doing we're not treating the planet very well. So I wanted to have, be able to have that in the background. Of course, in 1968 in London, that's not part of the content. Yeah. Uh, whereas in Dungeness, in 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 2019. 2020 it is part of what's going on and on that little spit of land where they live i think anybody living there is very conscious that if there's a really bad storm and a high tide they're not going to be there anymore you know it's yeah. a precarious landscape uh, and so i like you know so it was i, I at the moment i am preferring work, writing about the present is that why you chose dungeness as the backdrop um yeah i think it is i wanted somewhere that had that sort of scandi noir setting that was in within natural history and and Dungeness is an extraordinary place I mean it's described as a desert and it really isn't a desert it's one of the richest ecologies in the south of England you know it's got more species of bees um, than anywhere else some of the plant life there's amazing I'm, I'm learning this stuff as I'm going along but you know so I half chose it by accident but I did choose it because I did like that sort of natural history setting which isn't very crime I know but I quite again I quite like mixing the two well, Ellie, Ellie Griffiths has done the same with Norfolk and stuff, so it's not exactly unusual. No, I think landscape and, and crime go together very, very well, because the other thing is that landscape creates characters uh, and creates a sort of, you know, the character of, of William South that um, somebody has just mentioned in the comments, it came out of the la landscape because I, I thought, who's in this? I wanted to set something there. Who's in the land? What sort of people live there? I want him to be a police officer. Oh, what if he's a bird watcher as well? Because bird watchers flock to Dungeness to see the migrations, and it's got an extraordinary birding community there. What if he's a bird watcher? And I thought, well, actually, that's quite interesting because police officers and birders do very similar things. They have great patience and they have great observation skills, and they carry little black notebooks in which they note things down. And so, you know, I thought, ah, oh, now I know who he is. But he came out of the landscape. And I think landscape gives you a lot when you're writing in that way. Um, I was th just thinking about the um, 
the the historical side of things and thinking what have you learned from writing that series that you brought into this one oh um i think i learned in that first series i think i learned um a lot about how to write relationships um because the relationship was quite weird between um there's two people breen and toza breen's a 33 year old man and there's a 22 year old um police constable that he's working with and they kind of are as it turns out they become alex cupid's parents um but um i learned a lot about how to do that um in that and that was quite an interesting thing i hope i can carry that over i also learned because i started doing it from the cultural point of view but also i think i learned how to incorporate politics in the crime fiction because what i'd always do when i start a new book i say okay this one is going to be set in march 1969 what happens in 196 march 1969 so you go and you the first thing you do is you look up old newspapers and so you're getting all the political stories coming in there and the second book i wrote was called the house of knives and it it turned out to be a book about um the early the arrival of the of heroin in london in a major way which was beginning to change uh, from being quite a small community of addicts into quite a big one and actually a lot of that was political because we started what has been our pol our political response to drugs very much around that time um prior to 1969 we'd had a very different attitude and actually quite a benign attitude and then we followed very much the american at american sort of model about um make a uh, making drugs very illegal and a criminal thing. And I'm not trying to say one's right or not the other, but the, polit the politics sort of fed in really well. And I found that really interesting that writing a crime story was a really good way to include politics and to think about it a little. And it makes it sound like my books are very serious, but but the point is that they're supposed to be entertaining all the same. I just find it very, It's. It, I, like, I like learning stuff as I write. Yes, politics was in Grey's End as well. Um... What do you think that um, it allows, allows you to do, say about politics that you wouldn't be able to say if you, you weren't doing it in crime? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. You know, it's a really good question, partly because I've got strong political views like everybody has, and I have biases. And I think, but when you're telling a story, you have to park your biases um, to one side to a certain extent. You know, in, in um, Gravesend, I'm writing about badgers. Now, if you talk to a farmer about a badger, they will say badgers are animals that infect my cows. They are a real menace. They can, you know, they even kill lambs and all that sort of thing. You know, they, they stop me from doing my farming. Um, my, my personal view to that would be like, I, farmers need to wise up a bit. But in the book, because I'm writing some people from those communities, I've got to give those people that voice. And I think it's a legitimate voice. And I think yeah. writing the story, if you want to make real people, you can't be um, the sort of one dimensional view that I am sometimes about politics. You've got to bring in their thing. So I think it's really great form because I can have the sort of Dudley do right ecologist talking right on Save the Badgers at the same time as showing the other points of views. And I just think so. So um, fic fiction, not just crime fiction, I think does politics really well. Um, yeah, you go to libraries to research as a question. I, yes, yeah. love desperate to get to back to the libraries at the moment. I'm really missing it. Anyway, sorry, Alex. No problem. Yeah. If if you spot another question like that, feel free to answer it. That's fine. Thanks. It's so nice to be interviewed. I've been spending the last eight weeks interviewing other people. This is such a luxury. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you because you said you were going to go back. Is there anyone you didn't interview that you want to still interview? Do you think? Uh, Ian Rankin, probably. I haven't asked him. I'm quite. I've never met Ian Rankin, and I. But you know, I'm a big admirer of his stuff. But maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll um, get the um, courage to go and ask him if he'll do it. Other than that, I've done pretty well. I think I should try some American ones. I'd like to speak to Sarah Peretsky, who was really influential to me when I was younger, and. Um, on the day that Gravesend got out, I got a message from Sarah Paretsky saying she was reading Deadland because she's also got a book called Deadland that came out just recently. And she re first she sent me a message saying, I'm really sorry about this. I didn't know I would have called it something else if I'd known. But um, she, her, you know, the I. Warshawski series in the 1980s, I think is one of those books that laid the foundation for where we are now. So I, maybe I'll try and interview her. Um, what? 
would you advise for anyone trying to do streaming to avoid? Ah, yes. I think the main thing to avoid, as I've discovered, is panic. Because uh, it always, I mean, you've been doing it seamlessly, but I seemed, the last week of stuff I did, everything went wrong. There's something went wrong in every single uh, thing. And um, you just have to calm down because I don't think, it's it's on Facebook. It's on the internet. Nobody expects it to be like television. I, ha I used to have to ke keep telling myself that. And actually, at the moment, people just want us to be normal, don't they? Do you know what I mean? I think most of us are missing this kind of conversation and also being able to see your room and your CDs behind you and stuff like that because we've been yeah. stuck in yours for too long. It's uh, all my audio books I've got, like. Ah, that's brilliant. Well, yeah. that, that kind of figures. But do you know what I mean? I just think it's that... that uh, I think we just want a bit of normal conversation. I'm really missing going out and uh, seeing people again. I think it might be starting. I think people are doing a bit of that at the moment, aren't they? But, but uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, Michael Con Connolly, that'd be a good one, yeah. Uh, yeah, lots of writers. Lots of American writers I'd like to have a go at. But the time difference is a bit awkward. Maybe I'd have to have them later in the evening. Um, is there anything that you've been doing other than the interviews like your hat making and stuff that you really enjoyed doing under lockdown um i've been doing all sorts of things actually i've just been I've, i'm quite um I, I tend to do a lot of stuff at once um rather than I'm, I, there's these writers and they sit down at eight o'clock in the morning and they write till eight o'clock at night whatever and i don't really do that i'd sort of sit in front of the computer but i'd like to do lots of other things so i've been i've caned a chair I'm learning Norwegian. I'm um, reading books, obviously, um, just as many other stuff as I can do. You know, I quite like to keep busy. Um, yeah, uh, my my chair is very good. I almost finished it today. I should have brought it and shown it in the in the, in the video. But um, yeah, when did I? Uh, Caroline's saying, when did I first meet the other Brighton massive, Domenica and Leslie? Um, that was. I when I got my first book out, um, my publishers had a bit of trouble. Really, they um, th they had to put themselves up for sale. And so at the time when I was having books out, um, and my publishers, I love them. I, I'm really loyal to them. They're, they're Ali Griffiths' publishers as well. They were having a bit of a wobble, and I suddenly realised, well, I've got to do this myself. All writers should be doing a bit of of um, promotion themselves. So I got in touch with writers I liked, and um, writers I liked were nearby. And I literally emailed um, Ellie Griffiths, Susan Wilkins, another one, and um, said, can I do some events here with you? What would you do? And, and, and Ellie Griffiths is so enthusiastic. That was her, uh, introduced me to um, Leslie Thompson as well. And I just thought, wow, they're brilliant people. And it's been a real, I've learned so much just being around them. It's been great. Yes, Dominica did put a great picture up with the with the grave on. Yes. <laughs> Maybe laughed, laugh. yeah. Yeah, that was lovely. Yeah. Um, and somebody is saying, saying, what are you currently reading? Uh, and I'm actually just finishing off Jane Casey's The Cutting Place, which I really liked, which was, a, a, I've never read any Jane Casey to my shame. Uh, so, but it's a great book. Yes, I'm just reading Blood and Sugar. Ah, okay, very good, very good, yeah. That's a great book. Uh, and uh, low price on audio at the moment, I think, as well. Yes, it was a audible daily deal, I think, yesterday, which was quite funny, really. Because um, I just got it a week before, which is, yeah. Will Templeton says, do I have any interest in, did I have any interest in bird watching already, or is that purely for the book? I did, actually, I did, but I'm not a very good bird watcher because I'm not very patient, um, and I'm not, that sort of person who, you know, my wife is far better at spotting birds and can can tell me what they are. But I, I don't know what it, I'm not just not very good at. I love reading about it and I love the actual um, thing about it. But I'm not very good at sitting in a field for half the day watching stuff. Whereas my brother, when I was growing up, my brother was that boy, and my brother was very much um, the character. The young William South in that book is entirely based on my brother, who was that. Boy, and I think there's a lot of young, um, and it seems to be boys, but it may be different now, 
actually kind of find themselves. You get this type of person, and Zoe's based very much on that as well, these people who find themselves through natural history, not through hanging around and being teenagers in the conventional way, but quite getting into learning stuff. And, you know, there's, there's people who teach themselves a lot of stuff. My brother just knew everything about natural history, and I had no idea where he got it from. He was just absorbing that stuff, and he could – he and he's still like that. You're with him in the field and say, oh, look, and he'll point out something. I've never – it's not even entered my sort of um, vision and he spotted it. And I think you get these people like that. I think they're brilliant, but I'm, I'm a useless bird watcher. Sorry, Alex. It's all right. No problem. Yeah. That's what, that's what the chat stream is there for. It's mm. Yeah. Um, I was just curious about the, um, the Brighton area and, um, why, why, why you didn't decide to write one in Brighton? Well, Peter James would send round the heavies. He would he'd send round the um, the the uh, his police car with Peter James on the side, and I think he kind of, you know I think for contemporary Brighton he kind of owns that landscape, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? I think it's quite hard to write another one in in that space. Um, and I think um, yeah, it would uh, it would be difficult. It's also yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's quite good to write about, I think, for me anyway, I think writing is about imagining. And, you know, people say write about what you know. I, I, I think it's almost write about what you kind of yearn for or wish for or kind of stuff. So I quite like to be, half of me would quite like to live in Dungeness. So I find it easier to imagine and make that stuff up in a weird way. If it's in your street, you're kind of, it's, it has a sort of mundanity about it that doesn't make you imagine. And I think that's it's a really interesting part of the process is, is why some places and sometimes fill writers' heads with stories. And so Dungeness, I found a really easy place to imagine stuff in. I'm not sure I would do with Brighton. I don't know. Uh, yeah, um, I, I do find it hard to write locally as well. Um, is there anywhere foreign that you'd uh, want to write about in the future? I, I would love to. I would love to write about um, places. I mean, you know, I think it's quite interesting what we can't write about. I, I, I grew up in a lot of the time when I wasn't in Devon, in um, West Africa, because my dad was working for the British Council. And I spent a lot of time there. And I find it really odd that we are only now beginning to read books about the real Africa. And, you know, I, why, why, why couldn't I set something in Lagos? But whenever I've suggested that, Publishers who are very conservative said, oh, people wouldn't really read a book set in Lagos. So they'd accept Dungeness or, or, or a European city. But I think um, it's quite hard to um, to find places. But, yeah, all sorts of places I'd like to write about. But uh, I think uh, partly because I like writing series, I think the thing is get, get stuck in one place before you bite off the next yeah. one. You were interviewing someone that writes in Turkey, though. So. Yes. Yeah, Barbara Nadal, um, who has set books in Turkey now. I mean, she's on her 22nd one, um, which is um, phenomenal. And, you know, she knows a great deal about Istanbul and Turkey. And that, that what a lovely way to learn about it, because each book she has to learn a little bit more about it. So and, and Turkey. But uh, interestingly, when she started, the books, you know, were kind of thought as weird because nobody would set a book in Turkey. Now she's been doing it for 20 years. Uh, you know, it's sort of accepted. Uh, and you know, you get people like um, uh, the name's gone now. Who's the one who sets books in Florence? Um, really great writer, um, but she sets all her detective series in Florence. And you know, I, I'd love that ability to to then have an excuse to go there and really find a, find out about it because that's that you know, Dungeness is down the road, and I, I've loved finding about that place. And I actually know several people who live there now, and it's it's a real pleasure finding out. But maybe I should try somewhere a bit more. Um, exotic so now you've done two books with an animal basis are you going to do another one do you think i want to keep that going because partly because zoe the teenage character is obsessed with um natural history uh, and it's kind of like she's she's definitely one of those rather strange introverted children who who feels far more confident talking to older people about nature than they would do about talking to their peers about pop music or, or makeup but I know children like that. I mean, I know young people like that. I mean, well, she's 17 now. Um, and and I, I really admire them when they just say, well, I'm not going to 
I'm, I'm not into television and pop music. I'm just into this. And, you know, that makes them, you know, I think, I think most of us are actually far more different at that age than, than we're depicted. I'd love to see her when she gets to university. That'd be great, that would. Yeah. I'm quite worried. I, I'm really, it's the, it struck me now that how do I control the passage of time? Because if I'm writing a book a year there, can I keep them all in, in 2019 for a while and just keep her 17 for a little bit longer? Because um, I quite like understanding her at 17. Donna Leon, thank you very much. Whoever said that. Philip Kerr in Berlin, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. I, I, I don't want her to, to um, grow up yet. I want to keep her a bit younger. But yeah, university would be good. Because I think if she leaves home, Alex Cupid is going to really, really miss her. Because one of the nice things about her, the relationship between her and her mother, is her mother's quite casual and not very conventionally loving of her daughter. Only in extreme things when her daughter really messes up does she actually realise how desperately in love with her daughter she is. Um, and she would really miss her if she went away. She'd be, she'd feel bereft. Do have I got any plans to write a standalone? Well, as it happens, I'm writing one now. I'm writing another in the Cupidy series, and and um, also simultaneously writing a thriller that's set aboard a very expensive yacht in the Caribbean. Uh, and it's been going rather well actually. But in that one, I want to learn about seafaring and stuff. So I'm reading a lot of books that, are, you know, those kind of books written by single-handed uh, sailors uh, because I want to have that kind of element in it where the sea gets really rough and people have to survive when everything breaks down on a boat. So I am, I'm writing a, I'm writing a standalone and hopefully this one, the Birdwatcher was supposed to be a standalone. So hopefully this one will, will remain a standalone because I kind of, I kind of lost it with the, with the bird watcher, and, and uh, you know, people now get saying, "Well, it, is that first one in the series, or or is it a standalone?" And I'm not sure myself. How long um, after the bird watcher did you decide you could do a series with that? Um, it was probably about three months after it it uh, came out, and I I was um, by then I'd finished another book in the 1960s series. And I can remember going to um, a meeting at my publishers at Quirkus in London saying, this is what I want to do. And they were all going, they were all sort of, like, oh, that's really good. Because that's exactly what we were thinking. You, you know, they were just, they were all about to say, we want you to do a contemporary series. And I turned up saying, I'm about to do a contemporary series. So it was one of those nice things where you never know when you're suggesting an idea to your publishers where they're going to just put their head in their hands and say, no, no, just stick to the thing you're doing. Don't try anything new, but uh, they it went down very well. Yeah, the audio book's gone down really well as well. Uh, Jasmine's great. She is great, isn't she? This is Jasmine Blackborough, who's who is a actor who, who I just think she's phenomenal. I think she's really, really good because I'm very scared of listening to people read my words. I think it can be quite. It feels quite awkward because you. When you're listening back, you hear everything that you've done wrong and you'd rather do again. But she does it so well, I kind of stopped doing that and just listened to her doing it. I think she's a really great actor. It's, a, it's an extraordinary skill. The funny thing with the fact that she gave the badger a name, didn't she, in your interview? She did. She told me this uh, when she was um, talking about it. And like, she said, oh, do you mind if I tell you what the name is? And I said, no, no, tell me. She said, oh, Barney because I don't give it a name, because I do want to try and have some respect for the fact that I've got a talking badger in this book. It's not It's not a spoiler. Um, I've got a talking badger, but um, I do want to cover it from a natural history point of view. So badgers don't have names. It's, it's So mm -hmm. I, I didn't get a name. But I needed to find ways of identifying it as a character compared to the other things in the set, the other badgers in the set. But she needed to have it a name to think of the voice. So that he, she and her producer started calling it Old Barney, mm -hmm. which is lovely. Barney's a great name. I was amazed when, because I think that the day that you did the interview with it was the day she finished it. And that, that was, of course, in lockdown. That was, a, that was amazing, wasn't it? I actually spoke, I'd arranged. Like, um, at last year, I'd said to her, to her producers who do the audiobooks, this time I want to interview her when, when she's um, feeding up to the set. She said, what, they said, why don't you do it in the studio? 
um, while she's recording the book. And I said, great idea. So I was all prepared to travel up to London and meet her in the studio. But of course, that was out the window now because you don't travel up to London at the moment. And um, so she, instead we decided to do it by Facebook Live and it turned out she was in the studio and she was actually traveling into the studio to record audiobooks. The studio's deserted. They're running the, running the, at the desk from re remotely. So she just goes into this place and she has a producer who's literally twiddling all the knobs from their front room. Uh, and she sort of panned the camera around to show the studio being completely empty. But that was the day she finished the book. And, it, you know, they're quite a big job reading those books. I mean, it's quite a big job listening to them. But, you know, sitting there in front of a desk, just reading this stuff out and getting into the voices. Yeah, it's um, respect to her. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing the series. And I'm really going to enjoy um, spotting the... Um, things in the proof as well because they're really i can't believe it yes, when, when yes, they yes. Out, it's i'm cool. sending alex a proof because he happened and there was nothing fixed about it at all actually um i pulled his name from the hat and he wins the wins the proof and the proof the proof was very early stage actually i'm slightly annoyed when they when they published it because they um they um I sent them, literally, it's the pile of paper that I sent to the things. And I said, can I have one proof? Because I've got to go to a bookshop. And they printed all the proofs off that um, one. So it's it. You may, you may notice a few differences from the book you heard. That's fine, yeah. Um, it might take me a while with being dyslexic, so yeah. Yeah, no, I wouldn't hold you to it. I wouldn't hold you to it. You've already, you've got, you've got more than enough books to, to get through at the moment. Yeah, I did. I did manage to uh, break a record in your book. I managed to read it in two days, which is, which is ah. just, yeah. That's the thing about doing these interviews, Alex. You see, you have to do a lot of yeah. work to get them done. But thank you, you very much. Yeah. It's really brilliant, and, and you know, and also thanks to the UK Crime Book Club. It's been a real um, joy to be part of it and to sort of drop in and uh, see all the. You know, it's a really good community you have there. Yeah, we've got a new festival on the 25th coming up. Bank Holiday Festival. Excellent. Who have you got coming up at that? We've got um, Adam Mukherjee. Um, and we've got a Femme Fatale panel. And a, a poster on the site for um, with full details and all the others as well. Great. I'll catch up with that. Abby is brilliant. He's a great writer. It's a really good series that... Um, Sam Wyndham series. I've I've just um I've just finished reading the last one. I've, have you have you managed to read all of them? Or is it how far through are you? It's it's um uh, I'm on what's the second one? I can't um, remember. What, um, uh, 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 something man. That's the first one. Rising oh, oh yeah. spoken. A rising Man's the first, isn't it? Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it smoke and something or other? What's the? Oh, God, God. No. Brain smoke, like ash. smoke and ashes number three is the one that's been nominated for. Oh, I haven't read smoke and ashes. I've got it actually. Uh, in the in the in the pile of many things I must read. Yeah, is there anything that you're really looking forward to reading at the minute that you've got lined up? Um. What have I got in my pile? I want to. Re I've got the uh, next book I'm going to be reading is Damage Done by Susan Wilkins. I've got. Um, I didn't read the John Connolly Dirty South yet, which I've got lined up. That's not now. It's now coming up till not coming out till um, uh, September now. I think. Um, but I'm a big John Connolly fan. Um, yeah, lots. Big pile. Yeah. When is your hardback coming out then? Is it? Yeah, so the hardback was supposed to be coming out on Thursday, but they put that back to July 23rd um, in the hope that, that you it, it'll be available at the bookshops because it's been very hard um, selling any new books. It's been a very strange, a necessary evil. Thank you very much. That's the one. Um, a, um, I love that column. It's great. On the way, I'm not looking at the same thing as you do, so I just get these these uh, these words coming up probably slightly after you've written them. Um, but um, I've completely lost my thread there. What was I wittering on about, Alex? Um, books that you were looking forward to reading. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Lots. Uh, 
I, I, I'm actually almost looking forward to, um, I've got a lot of reading to do for this standalone stuff that's to do with all these C books. So I've just been in touch with my local bookshop, City Books down there, and they're sending me a big pile of all those big old sort of adventure books of, uh, you know, single people at sea. And I, I really love those stories, actually, non-fiction stuff about um, people in boats that have, a, you know, barely afloat. So is, is it going to be a locked room on a boat? <laughs> it is. It is it, it, it's kind of a locked room on, on a boat. It's um, two boats, actually. Um, one very, very expensive uh, yacht and, and, a, and a sailing boat as well. And they're trying to catch each other. And, and, uh, and there's a storm. Obviously, there's got to be a storm if you're in a sailing boat. Yeah. And the Caribbean does pretty good storms. So I'm reading all those stories where, where um, which I, lo I really love that. I mean, in my imagination, I'm the sort of person who could sail single handedly around the world. But I've never, you know, done it like like the bird watching. I'm, I suspect I wouldn't be very good at it. Has any uh, anybody got any questions for, for William out there that I've not asked? Very quick spot on the on the comments. Yeah, Caroline's saying, "When this is over, will you go on a bookshop tour?" Leeds is nice. I would love to go to Leeds. I almost, you know, I was going to go to Leeds Waterstones um, with um, Joe Spain uh, at the beginning of the year, and for some reason, uh, Waterstones pulled out of that one. But I'd love to go to Leeds. I, I mean, I love Leeds. I used to live in Leeds. I used to live in Headingley. And um, and my son is now at university there, so I Leeds definitely um, will go on there. I need I need to get to Leeds. That'd be really good. I'd love to. Um, somebody's also said, asked why I'm learning Norwegian, and I went there on a book tour last autumn, and I loved the place, and the people were so nice, uh, and. Um, I just thought I, I quite want an excuse to come back. And maybe if I, I learn Norwegian and can say thank you very much in Norwegian, they'll ask me back. So I've been doing my Duolingo every morning. Have you been translated into Norwegian yet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I need to, yeah. Um, and uh, all I know is the bird watcher in Norwegian is Fule Kikkerin. Uh, so I'm getting there. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it's, it's just a very nice culture and they love books like you know i mean i know we love books i mean england now but you go you go to some other countries like you even go to scotland and you just realize scottish people take books a bit more seriously than we do in, in a weird way you know they're, it's a very literacy based literal you know that's why there's so many great scots crime writers and so many great scots book festivals i'm looking forward to the bloody scotland that's when that comes I want to do all these festivals, 2021, I want to be there. Will I set a book in Norway? I, I, I don't know Norway enough yet. I'd like to, I think the thing is, I suspect there's some quite nice social divisions in Norway. When I went there, the very first thing I saw, Tusentak, somebody said, um, the first thing I, I, I was there with a um, Swedish writer and, and uh, she said, all the shops in Oslo are... Um, staffed by Swedes and I ironically said oh they're all economic migrants thinking that that was a joke and she said yes they all are because Norway is so rich that people from Sweden will go and and uh, leave home and, and work in Norway for a while so there's there's obviously there's something there but I don't know enough about it I need to learn Norwegian enough, well enough to be able to read the newspapers you'll have to talk to Sven who right? was a big fan of your show yeah I will do. Sven's from Hamburg, but uh, yeah. yeah. Boobs there, sorry. Uh, it's all right. He's he's a good man. Um, I think, um, yeah, um, I've been trying to model um, these shows on yours, and I can't think of any other questions. Has anybody else got one? I love, I love the fact that um, modeling on those it's been good, hasn't it? I mean, I think this whole thing of this um, type of live streaming with multi uh, interview, that multi panel sort of shows has worked really well. It's been a great discovery. My comments come through quite late, so if there are any more questions, they're coming. They'll 
they're uh, more likely to come late. Let me just um, bet you can't get my name right. Ah, oh, you see, I have no idea who that is. Um, but uh, is that Mel Olawabi? And I'm guessing that because I can't see it. Um, yeah, live streaming is brilliant, as somebody says. Because she's a she's a UK crime book club person, isn't she? Mel. Thank, thanks so much for this, William. It's been great. Thank you. Honestly, it's been brilliant. I really enjoyed it. And thanks so much for asking me on. I think I think we'll probably close there. All right. Yeah.